glad that y'all are all right. Enough strength in your body. Enough sanity to say, hey, I need to go and see about the Lord today. Amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. I'm Pastor Freddy. I'm a senior pastor here at Grace Restoration Church, and I'm just grateful that you are all here. Welcome back for some of you. Welcome for the first time, brother. But it's always a blessing to be in the presence of God with you. Um, time change messed me up today. I don't know if I messed y'all up. <laughs> Yeah, I had to turn my phone off and on a couple times to make sure I was seeing the clock right. It was like, am I really behind? But yeah, I really was. You know, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, things change, seasons change, and we have to roll with it, right? Amen. So, a um, couple things, you know, I want to talk about. First, and this is not, this was not in the announcements, but I'm going to just mention it now before I forget. Sometimes I do that. I'll spend three days saying, remember this, remember this, and then when the day come, I forget. I don't know if y'all do that. But I do it all the time. So while it's on my head, I'm just going to deviate for a second. And um, I don't know if you guys are going to be around. Uh, a couple of things that are coming up here in the next month or so. It is um, April 6th. We're having a women's conference here in this, in this facility. Well, actually, it's the entire weekend. It's the 6th, the 7th, and it's going to end on the 8th. Um, so if you guys, I know you're all traveling and everything, but if you're going to be around, we would love to have you here. Um, it's, it's an amazing time. I think my wife has some flyers or some information available to share with you all. Um, and we have a guest speaker that's going to be coming in with them, uh, Erica Dunlap. Erica Dunlap, former Miss America from uh, some years back. And she's, in, she's in this area. She's local. She's in Orlando. And she's going to be speaking on that first night. And then it's going to go throughout the weekend. Um, secondly, April 27th through the 29th, this, I know this is next month, but I'll give it to you now. Um, April 27th through the 29th, we're having a revival here. Okay, so it's going to be a weekend long revival. The Lord has been dealing with me on some things that I need to share with the church. And last year we had a revival, and it was amazing. Um, he truly spoke and, and, and did some amazing things that weekend, and I'm expecting him to do it again. Uh, he's giving me a fresh word, uh, and, and it's, it's always on, on time. It's always on time, for, not for just this church, but for the body of Christ as a whole. And um, I'm, I'm always excited when something to share and it tells me to hold it because I know he tell me to hold it is for a specific reason and it's, he's helped me to learn how to keep secrets and I struggle with that I, I struggle with keeping that for people amen, amen. so <laughs> well that's those two things now that I got that off my chest I feel all right so I'm going to move forward today and um, I want to talk to you guys about loving the unlovable it's, it's, a, it's something that we've all been called to do but that's the very calling that we struggle with the most. And I want to I touch on that today. And I had a really difficult time preparing this message. And I still feel like there's some more to it that, uh, that, that could be said. And I may end up having to do a part two another time. But there's just, there's just so much behind it. Um, and I want us to talk about it today. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up. We're going to read in uh, Luke chapter 6. You guys will stand with me for the reading. Luke chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 27. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. And then we're going to start at verse 27. We're going to go through verse 36. Is everybody with me today? Amen. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Somebody say credit. credit. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Somebody say credit. credit. Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Somebody say it. Credit. Come on. Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Come on, somebody say, stop expecting stuff. Stop. 
Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Most righteous Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We just thank you. I pray right now, Father, that this word does a special thing in our hearts, Father, that it changes our perception of what love looks like, that it changes our ideology of how we view love from ourselves and from other standpoints. I pray that we just align ourselves with way, the way that you say love should look. So, Lord, in my, all, all of my imperfections, I pray that your word goes forward perfectly, and that's my prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen? Amen, amen. amen. You guys may be seated. So in this text, there's several things in here that can be talked about. Um, and I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to start at the last couple of verses. Some things really stood out here. Um, when he says your reward, he says your reward will be great. And you will be children of the most high God because, that key word, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. So a sign that you're a child of God is partially described here as someone who is kind to the ungrateful and kind to the wicked. So when we try to find out what does it look like to be a child of God, sometimes we can misunderstand it as someone who dresses nice on Sunday mornings and go to church. We can misunderstand as somebody who carries a Bible around all the time, or somebody who can quote a scripture. Come on, somebody, because we all can quote a scripture to when we need to, amen? Somebody who has WWJD stickers on their car. Come on, y'all feel it, right? So we look at, well, who, what does a Christian look like? What does a child of God look like? And we can start thinking about all the external factors that will cause us to look like or act like Jesus himself. But what I'm seeing here in the text is that we're missing it when we use those as our criteria. Someone who is kind to the ungrateful and someone who is kind to the wicked will be great and will be children of the Most High God. This is a tough pill to swallow. Because I don't know if y'all are like me, but if somebody treats me a certain type of way, I have a tendency of reversing it and giving it right back to them. Maybe times 10, amen? So I don't know, I don't know if it's just me that do that, but, but I struggle sometimes in this area because there's one key word that will cause me to not do this, and that's pride. See, pride tells you to tell them how dare you talk to me. Pride tells you to tell them that you were right even though you were wrong. Pride tells you that you're better than them, therefore you shouldn't have to listen to them. These are all the things that pride will do. I don't know if y'all have picked up on this, but pride is the best yes man you will ever meet. Think about this for a minute, because when you're alone and you're rationalizing with yourself about how wrong somebody else was and how wrong that person was for saying or doing this, pride is right there alongside you. Know, all right. Yeah, out there, you know, you know what I'm talking. You know what I'm saying. Yo, you, you know what you should do, right? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying. Pride is always right there, agreeing with everything that you say, as long as it makes you right. As long as you don't have to be accountable to anything that came out of your mouth, or accountable to any actions that you did that may have led up to it. Pride will tell you you did everything right. So you need to go address that. Let's go handle it. That's what pride does, and. So here we are, I'm looking at this whole perspective and I'm thinking to myself, if I want to look like Jesus, there are certain things that I have to fix about myself. Because, see, when I got myself, or when I've been touched, changed, and healed, I shouldn't act and react the same way in this situation today that I did 10 years ago before I got saved. So I have to go back and ask myself, have you been touched? Have you been changed? Have you truly been healed? Or 
Are you still in the courtyards of the prison? Hmm. So I have to reevaluate what it looks like to be a child of God because, see, there are going to be people in our lives that treat us a certain type of way that we don't agree with. That's inevitable. We can't run from that. Matter of fact, in the Bible, matter of fact, I don't think it's in the Bible. It may be the 67th book. I don't know. But there's nowhere in there that says that you will not be mistreated. Or anybody say. So it's inevitable that we're going to run into people that are ungrateful to us, whether it be for reason or not. There's going to be people out there that are wicked towards us, whether it be for reason or not. But our response to it separates us and gives us the right to whether or not we can say we're a child of God or gives other people the right to look at you and assume whether if you're a child of God or not. So what are we showing people? Because there's going to be people that are in the church, come on somebody, that just can't get right. There's going to be people in the church that just can't get it together. Or it may appear that they don't want to get it together. Who am I to say? But the bottom line is, how we treat that individual says a lot about us. It says way more about us than it does about the flaws that they're portraying to us. That's the issue that we have to look at. Because see, when you look at people's flaws and you look at the things that people do, they give you enough evidence to, to, to talk about them, don't they? They're going to give you all the evidence you need to validate how you feel about them. They're going to give you everything. They're going to lay out their resume for you. This is why I'm all messed up. This is why you should not like me. This is why you should talk about me. This is why you should gossip slander, blah, blah, blah. But because of all that, and in spite of all that, if we are truly touched, changed, and healed, and being children of God, we will take that resume and throw it aside and say, but I still love you. How tough is that? How tough is that? How many times have we dropped the ball in that? I know I've dropped the ball in this several times, many times in my life. Because guess what? The key of this thing is this. I remember a time when I was messed up. I remember a time when I didn't care if I got it right or not. I was just here day to day living my life however I wanted to. I made whatever decisions I wanted to make based on how I felt that day. And there were people that looked at me and shook their head at me like, I hate you about nothing. But there was a remnant of people that said, I see purpose in him. Even though he's acting a fool right now. And even though he won't listen to what I'm saying about him, I know that there's purpose in him. So therefore, out of his ungratefulness, out of his wickedness, I'm still going to love on him and I'm still going to pray for him. Had they wrote me off the way everyone else did, I wouldn't be standing here today. So I want to tell you guys, you will come across people in the church that act like or appear that they don't want to get right. And those are the toughest people because we carry this mindset, I thought you was a Christian. Anybody ever said that before? I know I've said it, I've said it many times until I understood what it really meant to be one. And then I understood. But until I got to that place, I would always say, if somebody messed up and did anything that I, I knew it wasn't right, I thought you was a Christian. In other words, I thought you were perfect. So even still, through all of that, even people that are not Christians, when they see somebody who portrays himself as a Christian, they expect perfection. And when you don't give them perfection, you let them down. And guess what happens? When you let them down who don't know any better, they also start thinking that Jesus is the same way. Imperfect, flawed, hypocritical when he's not. So now, am I asking you all to be a perfect individual? I am not. But what I am asking is that we become more alert of how we treat people. Because in the text, I mean, it's very clear. To love your enemies. It's very easy to hate your enemies. That's what the world does. And it says, what reward, what credit do you get? Anybody want some godly credit? It said credit in here so many times. It said at least three times it was talking about credit. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? So what benefit is that to you? So why would God look upon you and say, let me favor this individual, let me bless this individual according to their behavior? So there's credit involved with your behavior. Wow. The 
Lord blesses those who have enough faith to do what the world won't do. He rewards those who command our Heavenly Father to prove himself true through our obedience. Loving the unlovable does not credit you anything. And when we love the unlovable, basically what that is to me is a gift of gratitude for somebody who loved me when I was unloved. You see what I'm saying? So when I have the opportunity to love somebody that's unlovable, it's me giving my gift back to God because he sent somebody to love on me when I was unloved. So we talk about a gift that keeps on giving. That's one right there. That's one right there because see, it shouldn't stop with me. I shouldn't receive the love and then it stays with me and then I become unloved with somebody else. There's a parable about the unmerciful servant who begged the king to give him another chance because he had this debt. Y'all know what I'm talking about. He begged him, come on, I know I owe you all this money, but just give me another chance. Let me make it right. And the king said, all right, I'm going to grant you grace. Don't even worry about it. Go back to your family. And as he was going back to his family, he came upon somebody that owed him some money. And when he saw that person, he was ready to beat him up. Give me my money. You owe me some money. Forgot about the fact that grace and mercy was just given unto him and that he should be walking in that grace and mercy. This is like a pair of shoes. When God gives you a pair of shoes, you wear them, you walk in. Grace and mercy are your shoes, left and right foot. You should walk in it. Everywhere you go, take it with you. But he didn't do that. He took the shoes off and he walked in what? In sin and unforgiveness, unmercy, unmerciful. So my gift back to God is showing that I can love on those who are also unlovable because that used to be me. I kind of look at it like um, a comparison. I don't know if you guys ever did this back in the day when I was in school. We used to have uh, like a twin day where you, would, you and your partner would dress alike. Uh, Y'all ever did that? Y'all ever did that? Just a few of us. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm just, I don't know, maybe it's just my area. Maybe we was just crazy. But we just had a day where we had a friend and we would just dress exactly alike. You know, same hat, same shirt, pants, shoes socks, whatever. And we just dressed like twins. And everybody knew when they came in, you know we're going to be dressed like twins. They already knew it was me and my buddy. They're going to do it right. They're going to have a fitted hat on and everything. They're going to do it up. And so I look at our walk with the Lord and it's something like that to that degree, whereas you get with your friend, you make an agreement. This is what we're going to do. This is how it's going to look. This is how it's going to flow. We need this hat, we need this shirt, these pants, these shoes, whatever. And then when I go home, and I get up the next morning to get ready for school, and I look at the alphabet, and all of a sudden, it's time for me to put it on. And now all of a sudden, I'm, I'm unsettled about the alphabet, and I decide I want to change some stuff. You know what I'm saying? Well, oh, this shirt, yeah, it was cool, but I think I'm going to wear this other shirt instead of the shirt that we agreed on. And now that I'm going to wear that shirt, these pants don't really look right with this shirt, so now I've got to change my pants up. But I'm going to keep the shoes on, and I'm going to still wear the hat and the socks. But I'm going to change the other part. So we'll still kind of be like twins, but people will notice the difference, though. And that's how we are at our walk with Christ sometimes. We have that agreement, Lord, wherever you send me, I'll go. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I want to look exactly like you. When people see me, I want them to see you. But then when it's time for us to put our foot to the pedal, well, I won't do it exactly like that. Because if I do it exactly like that, who knows how the response is going to be. So I'm going to do a little bit of that. I'm just going to wear the shoes and the hat. But I'm going to tweak it a little bit and do it my way. Y'all see what I'm saying? And then when we tweak stuff, we tweak stuff away from the way God wants us to do it. And then we end up hurting people. Because we didn't do it the way he said to So I end up not talking to the person the way God told me to talk to the person. I end up hurting that person's feelings. I don't treat the person the way God told me to treat the person. I end up hurting that person's feelings because I tweaked the agreement that we originally had when I said that I would submit myself to whatever it is you say to do. And it's a process. Don't get me wrong. It is a process to come out of that mindset, to come out of that willfulness to just say, I'm going to do it my way. Anybody ever been so strong and just so stubborn? You recognize something is not right in you, but because it's been a part of you for so long? Y'all getting quiet on me right now. <laughs> Y'all getting quiet on me right now. 
It's been a part of you for so long that you recognize it is not right, but it just feels good to keep it right next to you. Just a little longer. Just a little bit longer. So you can be stubborn with criticism. I know it's hard. I know it's not right to be critical of people, but come on, they ought to know better than that. Do that. As soon as you throw that butt in there, you're trying to negotiate so that way you can remain in agreement with being a critical person. Looking down on other believers who would make decisions that you wouldn't make. Mm. See, I can touch on that all day long. I can go there all day long. Because you're a Christian, and they're a Christian, and, and you make this kind of decision, but they probably will make a decision that you wouldn't agree with or that you would never do because you're so sanctified. And now you're looking down on them because they decide to make this decision that you would never make. Anybody ever done that before? Too stubborn to let go of gossip. Too stubborn to let go of, of, of turning away from slander. Y'all get quiet with them. Y'all all right? <laughs> want to make sure I uh, Come on now. I, sometimes I, I do that, and I might hit a toe every now and then, but I got to keep moving. I got to keep moving. And so these are things that we have to look at when we're talking about looking like Christ. We're talking about what does it look like to be a child of God. There are some things that we're used to doing that may appear right to us. The Bible says that there are things that seem right to a man, but surely leads where? Yeah. It leads to death. There are some things that we've been doing all our lives and been able to get away with all our lives, and then when we become a new creature, there is scripture that will contradict some of the things that we do now, even though it's a part of our normal routine. But because we've been programmed, we program ourselves to be that person, it's hard to let it go because we can justify some kind of way or another why we should hold on to it. It surely leads to death. I talked about pride earlier. I think one of the hardest things when it comes to pride is not only recognizing that it's wrong, but proactively doing something about it. That's the thing right there. Because we get stuck in the middle, somewhere between recognizing it and doing something about it. We get stuck somewhere in here in a place called validation. And when we get stuck right there, there's no way possible to look like Christ. He's never stuck in the middle. He recognizes the issue, he has a solution, and we go from here to here. And that's what he expects of us. But a lot of times we get stuck right in here. Well, I can do that because, or it's the only reason why I said it was because, or if they hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that, or how dare you talk to me like that. Y'all, we stuck right here in this validation process, forgetting that our behavior to begin with, or our actions, our words, or things that we said or did not say was the root of why we're in that position anyway. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And so we have to come to this place. We really and truly want to look like Christ. If we really and truly want to be called what, what this scripture talks about as a child of God, we have to stop looking at what people do through our own eyes and learn to start seeing people the way God sees them. Amen. We have to start seeing people the way God sees people. Amen. <laughs> We have to start talking about people the way God would talk about people. Amen. Because if I say something that is not godly, but it feels good to me, should I not correct myself? Yeah. I should. I should correct myself because, see, now, here I am becoming that judgmental, critical person that says he's like a child of God. But I'm talking negative about somebody. I'm speaking bad about somebody. Or I'm having some type of a motive behind the words that I say that doesn't align with the word of God. If I ever find myself in a position where I'm talking about someone, but calling it tough love. <laughs> y'all come on now, y'all stay with me. See, tough love is the scapegoat to talk about somebody, ain't it? That's our scapegoat, oh, that's just not but tough love. Yeah, you, you're terrible at this, you're terrible at that. You No, you're condemning and you're talking down to somebody, you're cutting them down, but yet you want to use the word tough love as your means of doing it. That's not what Christ did. Was he tough? Yes. Did he cut us down? No. Absolutely not. That's your flesh. That's your pride. Of you feeling like you're better than someone else, therefore you have the authority to talk down to someone who will do something, but not as good as you. Planting seeds of division. These are the things that happen so often that we overlook because it's a seed. It's so easy to overlook seed. If you walk through the dirt, from here to the park, by the way, you will probably walk across 100 seeds, but you won't see them, right? But then next season, when they spring up to a bush or a tree or a flower, you're like, I didn't even know they had planted a seed there. 
that's how it is when we talk, when we speak to people, when we say things, and we overlook the severity of what we're doing because it's such a small thing that we've done in our eyes. But then when we see that person who is insecure or they have fear of stepping out because somebody told them they wasn't good enough or they're afraid to, to, to move in their calling because people told them that they wouldn't be successful. When we start planting these little bitty seeds and not really looking at what we're doing or saying, we have no idea of the effect that it's having on that person's life in the course of their life down the line. But yet we'll justify it because of what they did today. Nobody's today should ever dictate their tomorrow, all right? But oftentimes we speak to people in such a way that because of this is how you are today, I'm going to speak to you as if you are that person for the rest of your life. I know one thing's for certain, it's difficult to speak blessings and declare anything good over someone you have ill feelings toward. So how can you be a disciple of Christ and you have ill feelings toward someone and then furthermore you allow yourself to fall into that? You start treating people according to how you feel. If you treat people according to how you feel, do you know that how you feel about them is going to change? According to how you are, according to your day, how you woke up that morning. But if we just keep ourselves in the place where we see them the way God sees them, there'll be more consistency in our relationships. There's a lot of relationships that last maybe two years, at the most four years. I'm talking about just overall relationships, not marriages only, but just relationships in general just don't last long anymore. Why? Because we don't know how to view each other. We don't know how to agree to disagree. We don't know how to just speak into someone's life. We don't know how to see them the way God sees them. We don't have that concept for the most part. We see you for who you are today. If you make a mistake, then we hold that over your head forever until we decide to just separate. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. So where do we get our rewards from? We get our rewards from loving and being a lover. And how do we do that? We emulate what Christ did. See, there was a season in his ministry where he had to deal with ridicule. He had to deal with people who mocked him and who talked about him. He had to flee from people who wanted to beat him up. He had to go through all these things for those three years or so that he was in ministry. He had to face people that he knew he was going to die for. Have you ever been in a situation? I'm going to ask y'all a question before I even go into that. Imagine, I mean, it's not even a question, imagine you have someone in your life that you really could care less about. You won't give them any of your resources. You won't give them time of day. You won't provide anything for this person because you really don't care for that person that much. But then, something happens. You're in a dangerous position and that person willingly lays their life down. Now, I'm trying to make this as real as possible because we know we talk about Christ at the end of the day, but I'm talking about in your real life. Think of somebody that they crawl across your mind right now that you really care less about. Because they, they behave, you know, they, they're ungrateful, they're wicked, you know what I'm saying? And they just carry themselves in such a way where you're like, I just want nothing to do with that person at all. But then that same person, when the heat is on, that same person throws themselves in the line of fire to lay their life down for you. How would that make you feel? How would you view that person out? My hero. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But yet, we miss those opportunities to connect with people like that because we just don't want anything to do with people. We don't see people like that. Jesus did the exact same thing that I just mentioned. I had to use some real example. Like if there's a person that's in your, your job or wherever, that's a real life example. So we have to learn how to love the unlovable because see, this is what happens in that situation. Jesus learned how to love the unlovable. He knew how to do it. If he didn't know how to do it, we wouldn't be here today. That's just, a, that's just a basic fact. We wouldn't be here today because we were all unlovable at some point in our lives. People called us cute when we were babies, but we were still at some point we did some things that really ticked some people off, all right? <laughs> and that's just the reality. But however, in the midst of his ministry, he was facing people that ridiculed him and mocked him and just made fun of him and was willing to beat him up if they had a chance and even to the point of the cross where they beat him to a pulp. His love was so deep for them. That he made sure he lived long enough <laughs> to finish it. Look at the abuse that he took. 
the average human would have died hours before he did. Hours before he did. His love was so strong that he made sure that he didn't die until all of it was finished. Do we have that kind of love for someone who doesn't love us the same way? Do we have that kind of love for those that are difficult to be around? So when we say we want to look like Christ, this is what it looks like. This was in the small print that you missed when you gave your life to Christ. <laughs> Y'all know how it is, you sign in the signature, you sign your life away, sign your life away. That small print on, on page 37, you missed it. You have to be able to love those that don't love you back. And you have to be willing to love them the way Christ does, even if they don't change. It's tough. I just gave y'all a tough pill to swallow, so if it take you a week or two to get it, that's fine. It take me a while to get it too. And so, the love of Jesus is not easy to obtain, but once you get it, it's even more difficult to sustain. It takes time to get to that place where you love like he did. It takes time. It takes a lot of failed efforts. It takes a lot of time, like, yeah, I dropped the ball on that one. It takes a whole lot of those, yeah, I let that relationship go out the window and I really could have fixed it. It takes a lot of those situations to learn from before we actually get to the place where we recognize what his love truly looks like. But then once we see it, it takes even more work to keep it. Why? Because the enemy now recognizes that you have a connection with the Lord and now he's going to throw everything at you to validate why you should not love to that capacity. And it's difficult, but we have to make sure that we maintain it. Because that's what he did. He did it not for those, not only for those who followed him and trusted him, but for those who didn't. So this is my encouragement for you today before we close, is this. If you know somebody that you shunned away for whatever reason, because they just didn't fit what you thought would be a cool person to be around, I'm going to be honest with you. That was an ungodly yeah, pastor got to say that sometimes. You know, people, you want to hear all the good stuff, but don't ever correct me. You know what I'm saying? That, that's the mindset we have in church. Today. Yes, edify me, prophesy to me, pray for me, but don't ever correct me. It's the reality. It's, but the reality is this. If you ever have anybody in your life that you push to the side simply because they don't fit what you thought you were a good friend, that was ungodly. And God has called us to a place of repentance. He's called us to a place of getting right. Now, does that mean you have to be best friends with that person? No. He didn't call us to be best friends with everybody. He came to separate mother from daughter. So he's not saying that you have to be best friends with everybody. But you have to get it right. See, because this place right here is a place for offerings. And we can't make any offers to him if we have an art against somebody else. So we can praise, shout, holly all we want to. But if we have relationships, that were just, that went bad, and it was something that we could have fixed, or something that we need to reconcile, or just maybe even just, I apologize, or whatever, whatever it is. If you have not done that, the Bible says that leave your offering here, and make it right first before you give me anything, because I won't take it. That's how sovereign our God is. He doesn't need our things. I don't need your things. This is what he's saying. I need you to get right with that person, because that's more important. And so I just want to put that on your spirit. Just think. I know the Lord is putting some people in your spirit today, probably, if you have any. He's putting it in your spirit. And that's between you and him, how you do it. But if we recognize something is not right, it was not done in a worldly fashion, it's up to us to fix it. We can't just skip it and go around it. Y'all know sometimes people say, time heals all wounds. No, it helps you to forget about it, but the wound is still there. Because even if you can forget about the person you hurt, they might still be dealing with it. When you hurt somebody, it changes their life until they're healed from it. And healing comes from reconciliation. So the person that I am today, it started off as a person who had been wounded. And wounded. And I think a part of me and how I am is also a factor of the wounds that I've dealt with in my past. But I do recognize one thing, that my healing comes from him. Amen. Because there's some people that will not reconcile with you. There's some people that will not accept your apology. It's just, it's just a reality of what it is. But if they don't accept it, can you still be okay? 
but it, it, because the forgiveness is for you. When you reach out to them, it's for your healing. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So we have to be a healed body. That's the way we do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going I'm to sit down for a minute, but before I do, I want to ask, is there anybody that needs prayer? Is there anybody here that may be convicted about the word and need uh, some kind of a prayer for the Lord to help you out? You know, because sometimes we don't know what to say. Is there anyone here that has not given their life to the Lord? Because see, without him, nothing is possible. Without him, you'll never come to that place of understanding what it's like to love your loved one and be called a child of God. I want him to see me as his child. I want him to be proud of me. In all my imperfections, I want him to say, that's a man after my heart. Is there anyone here today that has not given your life to me ever want to do so today? If so, you may stand, raise your hand, or whatever, you, however you want to acknowledge it, and we'll make sure that happens. Amen. Amen. So everyone's here? Everyone's good? In the season that God calls you to your next level, you won't be able to resist it. Whatever it is, you won't be able to resist it. So whoever has a, a, a next season, God has a next season for everybody. But there are certain things as protocol. You know what I'm saying? Before he releases his blessings to you, it always feels good to know that God wants to bless you. But we have to be honest, there's a protocol to receive the blessing. Number one, it is salvation. Number two, it is walking with him and following him as we spoke about last week. Number three is submitting yourself to him. See, if you can put those things in order and do those things, you will truly see the glory of God over your life as you've never seen. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm, worried. I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to ask Brother Drew to come up and close us out um, with some, a few words, if you don't mind. And then we're going to close out here. Thanks, Brother. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great word. Great word. I venture to say that we all have someone in our life that's probably unlovely to us. Um, I know I do. That's our opportunity to speak life into them and not death. That's our opportunity to look more like Christ. He gives us that opportunity with those unlovely people in our lives so we can become more like him. So, church, what a great word, that's. We have our opportunity set before us, praise God, for our good. Yes. You might think that unlovely person is, is a thorn in your side. And, uh, well, I know you could give them, call them other words, but... <laughs> The reality is, that's our opportunity, praise God, to look more like Christ, speak life into them uh, today. So, great word, Pastor. Thank you for that word. Uh, church family, thank you for coming today. Uh, the back of the, the hall there, there's an offering basket you're led to, to give today. You may do so. I'm going to pray us out. Uh, dismiss you. Our heads. Thank you, Lord, for giving up such a great word to our pastor today. I pray that we all receive it. It's vital to becoming more like you. Father, give us the strength, the courage to face those unlovely people and speak life into them. Father, and as we speak life into them, we grow and become more like you. So I pray, Father God, that we hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us, giving us words of life to speak, and we have the courage to speak them. Father, I pray that everyone leave here, Lord, blessed with the word of God planted, implanted on their heart today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, you are dismissed.